So I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Brigadier General Professor Noonar Fatima Begum. Uh, she doesn't, uh, Madam doesn't need any introduction. She's the first pediatric cardiologist starting pediatric cardiology in Bangladesh in the late 90s. And since then, she has been the pioneer in many pediatric interventional procedures, not only uh, pulmonary valve replacement, but ASD closure, PSD closure, PDS training, coarctation sending, so on and so forth. And she is also the proud winner of Independence Day Award and Chenabahini Podok in the, in the year 2019. So uh, I would like to invite Madam to start her presentation on uh, Parkinson's uh, mitral uh, pulmonary valve implantation. Uh, Madam, please. Hello, everyone. Good evening, dear speakers, chairs, and audience. Uh, I'm welcoming you to, uh, all to my presentation on transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation. Before that, I would like to thank the um, organizers for in inviting me and Dr. Tofik for introducing me. So before going to the transcatheter, as the session already has completed about the valves, we know that the THB or transcatheter valves uh, these are applicable in four position, pulmonary position, mitral position, tricuspid position, and in the aortic position. So how the valve got damaged? There may be OR and TR, there may be calcification, there may be penis formation, uh, there may be endocarditis, uh, and so forth and so on. And there may be also dysfunction of the already implanted valve. So the uh, options for the tricuspid valves are there are options for the transcatheter repair with the help of clip, with the help of enoploplasty, and there is the chance of replacement also with the help of orthotropic and heterotropic valve. For the mitral valve, mitral clip, then pascal clip, uh, then various types of valve like tendine valve, uh, like dragonfly, there are many valves available. And for the pulmonary valve, there are also many kind of valves available. Some of them are placed over the conduit, and some are placed over the naked RVOT uh, or dynamic RVOT. So if we see the uh, carb, actually these are the disease of the adult and mitral valve diseases are more common than that of the aortic valve disease. And actually these are very, very uncommon in pediatric age group. Uh, in pediatric age group, we deal with the pulmonary valve, which is not actually a replacement for the primary disease. So when does it start? It was started in 2020 when Professor Philip Bonhoeffer, he started to treat the stenosis and regurgitation in a prosthetic conduit in the right ventricular outflow uh, tract. So this conduit is placed initially in the right ventricular outflow tract to treat some complex congenital heart diseases. So initially they were treated for the tetralogy of fellow for the truncus arteries as pulmonary atresia, double outlet right ventricle, transposition of great arteries, and even some of them had ROS procedure. And then there was dysfunctional conduit or there was severe PR or TR and RV volume overload. And then uh, this therapy was indicated. So my series is with the Melody transcatheter valve and Melody, Melody valve, its uh, indication is to extend the RVOT conduit life. Already there is a conduit there. So to extend the life of that conduit and to relieve the stenosis and to restore the pulmonary valve competence by relieving regurgitation. So what is the rationale? It helps reduce the total number of surgeries over the patient's lifetime because dysfunctional conduit, even if you replace the conduit, it may become dysfunctional again and again. So there will be multiple surgeries in the lifetime. So this valve can reduce the um, multiplicity of the complex surgical procedure. Then it encourages even early intervention and it is indicated in the patient implanted with the failed conduit previously. So metronic melody transcatheter pulmonary valve, is, it is actually a contagra type of valve and it is a bovine jugular vein, length of which is about 28 millimeter you are seeing here in the picture and it can be trimmed down to six millimeter and then again it is re-expanded. The same valve is re-expanded into three size by the 18, 20 and 22 millimeter size Ensemble delivery system. So name of the delivery system is Ensemble and you are seeing here there are three ports. One is for the inner balloon, another is for the outer balloon and another is for the wire. So this valve is inflated with the beep balloon. So what were the selection criteria? 
uh, selection criteria, as I have mentioned already, is the conduit dysfunction. And we should consider the weight because 22 French delivery system should pass through the femoral vein. So weight should be more than 18, but we are now doing in more than 15 kilogram. Conduit originally should be 16 millimeter and maximum RBOT should be 22 for this kind of valve. And exclusion criteria we are seeing here that active endocarditis, no venous excess, and unsuitable anatomy. So when we are going for selecting a patient, we should consider the age and weight of the patient because these are small children, their femoral vein is very small. Even if we use the jugular vein, it is also small. So 22 friends should pass through it and we have to consider about that. And then we use uh, for the de device stability in the position of the pulmonary valve, we need some uh, surgical history to know about the size of the conduit, type of the conduit, uh, and uh, et cetera. So what are the problems? You know that our country is uh, like a developing country. Most of the patients, they are poor from the poor socioeconomic status. So, uh, and we don't even have CMR. Uh, Till now. So if we don't have CMR, it is very difficult to know about the RB volume, quantitative assessment of the RB volume and the PR fraction. And selection criteria was based only in my patient on the basis of the uh, CT angiogram, echocardiography, and also by doing the RV angiography. And then another problem was arrangement of the valves, accessories, and other hardware. So you know, valve is not only enough, we need some covered stand, even some bare metal stand. And sometimes we need special kind of the catheter and supporting strong wires like lander fist uh, wire, which are not always available in our country. And funding of the valve is also a problem. I think our Indian friend, Indian friend will also give in this point. And in about the procedural challenge, as it is an infrequent procedure, because our surgical history is not so long, I have started in our country in 1998. So these are the post-surgical patient who develop this kind of complication, usually after 10 to 15 years of surgery. So in our country, surgical history is like 20 years. So in future, we'll get many patients and probably many of them will have money to do that. And suppliers challenges, funding constant, infrequent procedures, said so they, they are not interested to bring this because uh, they are the businessmen and here uh, business get little importance. And in my case, challenge, challenge was another challenge was to motivate the parents. They know that it is a new technology, so they are not sure about the future outcome. And many of them are convinced, though, as it can avoid future surgery. So though the cases which I have done, only reason was they wanted to avoid the surgery. So I have collected the fund for this patient from the many, many charity uh, project and also from the corporate social responsibility fund. And to avoid the complications, I followed the strict inclusion criteria for this patient. And even for the difficult cases, I called the proctor. So we accepted our cases with the conduit dysfunction only in our initial parts. Many cases with the transcellular page and with the native dynamic RBOT, uh, I have not included those cases, though they were in the need, but those are actually balloon, uh, not balloon expandable, but they were self expandable. Well and I have excluded those from my series. Oops. So this is about my patient's uh, characteristics. Age were about 9.5 years average. Most of the patients were female, 66%. And uh, age of the patient at the time of first surgery were like four years. And then AOT homograft was used in most of the cases, 66% pulmonary, homograft in 16% and bovine pericardial valve conduit was used in 16% of the cases. Primary diagnosis was tetralogy of fellow in two cases and pulmonary atresia uh, was the diagnosis in other cases. So this is the uh, result. PS gradient before the procedure, it was like minimum was like 45 millimeter of mercury and maximum was like 95. PR gradient, it was moderator, PR, PR was moderate. It was quantitative, moderate or severe. And then RV and diastolic volume was uh, more than 100 
40 ml per meter square in all of the cases. And in association, there was absent LPA in one of the cases, all RP and LP stenosis in two of the cases, and RP stenosis in one of the cases. And in the procedure, we have used general anesthesia for all the cases. And we have used CP stand as a landing station for this bulb in most of the cases. Only in one case, I used ender stand. And post procedure, you are seeing that there is uh, the gradient of the transpulmonary gradient was reduced in all the cases, and maximum gradient was seen 16 millimeter mercury uh, in one case only. And PR was elevated, eliminated in all the cases. So my uh, cases are in follow up now. Uh, first case was done in 2012. So this is now nine year of the follow up. All of them are doing well. Last case is in follow up now for two years. And they, all of them are doing very well. Uh, still now they're doing well with their, uh, uh, their bulb and uh, no further intervention was required. This is my first case, which I have performed in 2012. This patient's primary diagnosis was tetralogy of fellow with the absent left pulmonary artery we're seeing here. So we sent him for surgery and tetralogy of fellow repair transatial approach was done in 2007. But immediately after surgery, he again developed complication. So these are the angiogram after his uh, first surgical procedure. And then redo surgery was done again in 2009 and an orthotropic conduit was placed between the right ventricular outflow tract and pulmonary artery. And after second surgery, he again developed symptom within six months. And then uh, in the echocardiography, we found that again, there is severe conduit stenosis and um, there is severe TR and severe RV. So his RV pressure was in the cath lab like 100 millimeter of mercury. And this time parent refused to do any more surgery. So I was trying to collect a pulmonary bulb for him and it took about one year for me to collect everything. And on 25th December, 2012, we did this first case. We were seeing here the first case in the cath lab. This is the RV angiogram, AP and lateral view. You were seeing that uh, the conduit is here and it is a little bit calcified. Uh, so this is the calcified conduit here. And then here we are doing the measurements and here, we are actually dilating the conduit with a high pressure atlas balloon. And at the same time, we are seeing also that whether there is any coronary compression. Time asking. Okay, so this is here in the AP view. I am seeing again uh, whether there is coronary compression. We are seeing that coronaries are far away from the balloon. And then in, the, in this case now, we are doing pre-stenting. So here is the calcification. We are trying to cover this with the covered stand. And you are seeing that uh, it is a beating heart procedure. So during uh, actually uh, beat of the heart or during the cardiac output from the right heart, there is chance of little bit displacement of the uh, stand during inflation. And this stand displaced little bit uh, towards the right ventricle. So we, we are placing another stand here to cover the whole length. So this is the second stent. Both of them are covered stent. And then now we are going to the implantation of the valve part. This is the valve you are seeing here. And this valve is placed inside a glutaryl dehyde preservative. So you are now rinsing this valve in three saline baths. And then we are assembling it over the beep balloon of the ensemble delivery system. So this is now is the valve here. This one is the valve and these are the stand. So this uh, valve is going towards the uh, landing station inside the stand. So this is my uh, number six case. I just want to show you some of the uh, echocardiography we're seeing here that this is the pulmonary stenosis of this patient. Uh, pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary regurgitation. Here you are again seeing stenosis and regurgitation. So this is very tight stenosis you are seeing here. And there is a severe PR also. So this is the gradient. And here we are seeing in the CT angiogram, especially CT angiogram is important in these cases to look for the coronary artery and the calcification of the conduit. So these are the glimpses from the cath lab of the second case. And 
This is a very important uh, picture you are seeing here in this NGO that there is severe pulmonary regurgitation in this patient. Now we are dilating the right pulmonary. I have mentioned that one of our cases, severe right pulmonary artery stenosis. So this one we are dilating with a high pressure atlas balloon. Uh, right pulmonary artery stenosis is dilated. And now this is the stand. So this is the case where I have used uncovered stand. This is a bare metal stand, Andra. So this is an XXL Andra stand. And then now we are placing the pulmonary valve melody inside this stand. And after placing this stent, now after placing this, so how beautiful this pulmonary artery angiogram is. We have used a multi-track catheter here to do this angiogram. And we are seeing here that valve is in nice position inside the stent and there is no pulmonary regurgitation. And this is the certificate of appreciation from the Medtronic uh, Melody South Asia for the first ever implanted in South Asia. So in conclusion, percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation is an excellent treatment option in patient with RBOT conduit regurgitation and stenosis. Early result following PPBI was shown has shown a significant reduction in the right ventricular pressure and gradient across the outflow tract. The most common complication is stent fracture or pulmonary regurgitation in the context of endocarditis. And we got excellent result in our series. We have performed six cases in that series and all are doing well. Last one is in follow-up for three years and first, year, first one is in follow-up for nine years. And so PPBI has the potential to become the standard procedure in the treatment of dysfunctional conduit, even in the naked RBOT or uh, paced RBOT, and will be easy to uh, procure and will be easy to use in more and more cases if price is considered for the developing countries. Thank you all. Thank you for your patient hearing. Assalamualaikum, madam. I'm Dr. Suzul Rahman. Waalaikum salam. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Yes, madam. I'm fine. Uh, is Thank there you. any consideration of antiplatelet or anticoagulant in the implantation of? Yes, yes, yes. We give antiplatelet throughout the life. So antiplatelet aspirin is lifelong. Yeah. So we have to give lifelong aspirin therapy. Yes. Assalamualaikum, madam. Alaikum salam. This is Dr. Rizwana. Yes, Rizwana. Madam. So Thank I you. have seen that uh, the, uh, that uh, the lowest age you have said that uh, 15 years, the uh, 15 kg for lowest weight yes, of your yes. patient. Yes. So for femoral venous hemostasis, what would you prefer? Is it suture mediated closure or vascular precursor device or uh, the regular? Technique. Actually, in, in out of our six cases, in two cases, we use par close, uh, that is the closer device. But in rest of the cases, we use a figure of eight like suturing. And I found that that is very nice. And now I will never use par close again because par close is also we need to buy. And that suturing is possible with our silk and the needle only. So this is a figure of eight suture and that is very effective. And in our last four cases, we use that, that mechanism in this series. Yes. 